All right, that said, I'm going to start recording. Uh, so again, we will. I will end on time, and I'll try and arrange the logistics of the content coverage to get to the homework by the end of class at 9:40. Okay. So project one that is looming large in your mind, hopefully. If it's not, welcome. Uh, this is now in your mind. Um, so I've already mentioned these same things last week, I believe, but I'm going to say it again. So like. Kaggle and Data World are they're not like barred from use. It's just saying like they're not good references where to find data because like typically people have already analyzed it. And one of the requirements for the project is that you can't find existing analysis for this data. So that's important because I don't want to have to like deconflict it. Projects are not just part of your grade, they're also part of your portfolio. So when you leave here and you want to be employed as a data scientist somewhere or a data analyst or whatever else, um, people are going to wonder, like, why should I hire you? Right? Like, there's, <laughs> you're not a good market because there's not very many data scientists around. So maybe they won't even ask for a portfolio. But if they do, you'll want to be able to show them, this is what I've done. This is what I'm capable of doing. These are my skills. This is, might be hireable for your, for your position. And so what I see projects as sort of like demonstrations of your skill. So when you're submitting a project proposal, Try and keep that in mind. Like you want to be able to push where you're at, and then later in the sort of future semesters as you progress through the uh, the sections, um, you'll be able to go back and say, like, actually, you know what? That code was really poorly written back in 601, but I can rewrite it now much better. So like, it's not that the projects you're doing now will be presented to your employer, hopefully, but it'll give you a good starting point to say, like, this is what's relevant to an employer. I can spruce this up, maybe document a little bit more, and then present it to them. Okay, and then the last little note here is I think so far in this semester, in these few weeks, I've written three letters of recommendation already. So what happens is people go for a job, they want uh, you know a portfolio, a resume, and letters of recommendation. And guess who they turn to? <laughs> All right, so the person who has seen them in class. So that's totally fine. There are good ways and bad ways of asking for a letter of recommendation. If you say, for instance, Hey, I applied for this job and I put your name down for a recommendation. I'll be like, yeah, <laughs> that's cool. <laughs> um, so just you know, try and think ahead a little bit, or at least read the blog post about what makes a good request for a letter of recommendation. Okay. Uh, well, it's going to be a link uh, in the course notes that are available on Blackboard, but it's also at this URL. Okay. So. Uh, uh, then there's lots of little administrative things. So when I give you the homework, I'll typically have two slides after the homework saying, like, think about what you're trying to inputs and outputs and develop a plan. Um, and so sometimes that goes well and sometimes it doesn't. Um, one challenge that I see students sort of stumble with is they'll name a variable the thing that they want it to be and then hope that by naming it what they intended to be, when they're storing data to it, that will work out. Um, so it usually doesn't work that way. You want to figure out what the data is and then name the variable that's reflective of that. So if you're catching that there's an order there, right? You should name the variable to be descriptive of your data, not of your intent. So that's sort of like a little thing. Right, so, um, so the, the trick here is to sort of, another tip, think ahead about what other people have done before. Um, rather than you just sort of like randomly stumbling, here's some references and resources of very common modules that um, you won't have to think hard about. Like, it's worth reading about these. I'll just go to all of them. So three module of the week. If you haven't seen this website, it's worth reading. Basically. Here's a bunch of functions in Python or modules that might be useful, and they sort of go into each one of them. So later in the semester, we'll cover regular expressions. Don't worry if you haven't heard of those words before. Um, but here's like a big sort of overview of regular expressions and their use in Python 3. So it gives you a lot of walkthrough of very common libraries. Yes. So those are just sort of pointers two references for you to look at um, for like what libraries exist. All right. So hopefully everyone has a no everybody has a laptop. So 
what we're going to do is a little bit of hands-on exercise to get us started. We're going to go into a Jupyter Notebook, and we're going to try running these commands. Let me open that up. I'll get that right there. I might not have it. So try playing with these commands here. I'll open up a notebook. Anybody got the result from this yet? So one person has a result. I'll wait till a few other people raise their hand. We've got two, three. So if you if you if you're joining us late, um, open up a notebook and type these commands. All right. So I'm gonna type this command. So I've done import random. And I'm going to type deer, right? So for a little continuity, the last slide that I was talking about was talking about where do I find libraries? This slide is about how do I know what those libraries do? Right. So when I type deer random, a bunch of things come back. What is it telling me? Anybody have a guess? What are all those outputs from deer? Okay, so let's, let's see what, how that works out. So I've got random, and if I type that as a command, I get back just the words module random from blah, blah, blah. So this is telling me where it came from. That's not very helpful. If I type random dot something, like let's say sample, right, that's a function within the module. So that didn't work out to be exactly what I wanted, but I recognize that if I put some parentheses on there, it's actually gonna try and run that function. Now this one's gonna complain because this function was looking for two arguments, position, population, and k. All right. So now, now I've got some paths to go down. Right. I can say like, what libraries exist for each library? What functions exist? Okay. Now let's read about all these different functions. So that's one way of finding out how Python uh, works for you. Now let's do half random. All right. So not all um, modules that you find on the internet are going to have a help file, but this is basically just the top documentation from, I'm sorry, the, the documentation from the top of the source code of the module. So this is like a quick reference that you can not have to leave your your Jupyter Notebook environment to see what the use of this module is. Okay, so it's a pretty long one. Let's do the last one. All right, so this is just telling me more about, um, uh, you know, the same output as help but with a few extra words. Uh, Things that are so. Any questions? Basically, I'm arming you to explore libraries. All right. So, second activity. Now that you've got your notebook open, you can type things, right? So, some of you will have this, and some of you won't. I don't know why that feature disparity exists. If you do have it, congratulations. If you don't, you can uh, ask for my help later on and see if we can figure out how to get your notebook. I'm gonna just type the command import pandas. I'm gonna type pandas dot, and then I'm gonna press the tab key on my computer. So on my computer, I don't know, this may or may not work for you, but I recommend trying it. Just type dot after the library, and then the functions will come up. I don't have an answer. <laughs> All right, so this is this is just like a, a lazy way of being to run deer or question mark. Right? So now once I go down and select one of these, then I have that function. All right, so now I can see what's going on there. All right, so basically it's just tab completion. If you've never seen tab completion before, it's super cool and useful. It's available in some environments and not in others. Okay, so if you were paying attention during the bowling uh, example last week, uh, You'll notice in the video, I ended up with a whole bunch of commands. And if you watch the entire video, you'll see that I had 
to sort of like iteratively arrive at that. It wasn't just something I pulled out of my head. So this is just a, a, a caveat that when I give you complicated commands like this, I didn't just spring forth from my mind. So don't expect to do that yourself. All right, now we can get to lecture content, 720. So this is all about getting data. Um, this is like, to me, one of the first steps. And I'm going to cover both the technical skills of how do you get data on your computer, and I'm going to talk about soft skills, about how do you talk to people about getting data. Those are both vital skills. Um, if you only have one but not the other, you're not quite as skilled as the data scientist. So I'm going to try and cover um, both. This slide is all about sort of the technical skills you'll walk away with. Those I can sort of like have a stronger sort of specification of what the outcome is. The soft skills, um, I don't know whether or not you those up. But we'll go through some activities that are in-person and interactive. And then there's a little bit of like morals and ethics in here. There's a whole lecture at the end of the semester about morals and ethics. Um, but we're touching on it a little bit today. All right. So more talking ahead. Especially on science. So <laughs> if you've gone through the first three lectures and you're like, data science stuff, it's pretty straightforward. It sounds like programming to me. Well, that's pretty much all we've covered so far. And so I don't want you to lead down to the conclusion that data science is just about the data, right? Um, and so there is some common steps that we do. And this is mainly what I would call data analysis. It's all that sort of data grooming and like getting stuff together. But it's not really a scientific process. So like to spend a few minutes on distinguishing what this, what makes it data science versus data analysis. So we'll turn to the font of all human knowledge, Wikipedia, and ask what is science. Right? It gives us like this sort of useless explanation of like a definition, which to me is not where I'm going. So my question to you is, what do you think science is? So I'm going to be lazy, and you can turn to your neighbor, pair up you know, someone you've talked to recently, um, and ask them what is their perception of science. Introduce yourself if you haven't met the person before. Okay, take like one more minute and then we'll come back. All right, let's come back to our desk. Right. So I'm going to, so I didn't get a chance to talk, so now I'm going to take the floor back. So my process of science that, that, that I've observed, um, my background is physics, so I did a little bit of science before learning the real world. Um, basically, that you start with sort of a, this top loop of I observe some phenomena, and I have this human curiosity of, trying to figure out what is going on there. And then I make this story about what's happening. But because they taught me physics, I sort of like include numbers in this story. And that's what differentiates this from like other storytelling. Science is based on stories with numbers. That's important. And the relevance of these numeric things going on is that you can make predictions. And yes, in word-based stories, you can also make predictions, but these are quantifiable predictions. Right? And that's what really distinguishes science as a way of like gaining knowledge rather than just making predictions that are false. Um, and then once you make a prediction, you actually have to go out and spend the effort to test out whether or not it's uh, correct or not. 
And so that's where you make a test. And then like you learn something and you observe some new behavior from that experiment, you know, a new relationship that you didn't know before in this whole thing. So that's my story of what I think science operates like. So that sounded good, but um, often it doesn't work out like that. Typically, as a data scientist, are going to be bound by the business you're working with, how much money they want to spend on that knowledge being gained. And they're willing to spend as much money on the knowledge investment as will make them more money. Um, and so that bounds, it's not like a pure science. Data science is typically driven by a business trying to make money. And so if you're a business and you can make predictions about how your consumers are going to behave or uh, like how your packages are going to be delivered, right? So like, these are the types of predictions that a business wants to be able to do well. And if they can do more productive, if they can do them more effectively than other businesses, then they succeed. So it's not actually critical that the science be correct. It's just that it be more effective than other people's knowledge. So that's a slight distinguishing, right? When you're driven by a commercial environment, you should be driven by your uh, profit, which isn't necessarily pure knowledge. And then that's like this is to me like the the most common practice of data science is in like advertising and like movie recommendations and places where you want to make money, but it doesn't matter if you're wrong because you're still making money, right? Where it becomes a little bit more important, where like probably you're making money, but also like having some very measurable impact is like, let's say you're driving an autonomous vehicle, right? Doing, doing some data science and computer vision, and then like someone dies. So it wasn't just all about profit. It was all about profit plus the ability to not kill people. So sometimes sort of like the quality of the science depends on where your application is. That's right. So, like, if you can kill. That's right. So, the, so there's like, so the way I'll, I'll rip a little bit on this, right? So, like, and tell me if this is wrong. When you kill like a flight of passengers, there's sort of two impacts. One is on your insurance policy, which is a very clear, measurable thing, and the other is on your reputation. So, your reputation is harder to quantify, but there's still some business impact on how much revenue is generated based on your plane sales. Well, you can quantify it, just look at the stock market. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. So are there other factors that you would throw in that quantification of business impacts for health and safety? It doesn't does impact the business, the process of doing business, like the managers at home, like VP level managers have been having all hands type things. So we got to look at what we did wrong. So it affects the business culture. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> My girlfriend is in the medical field, and so like she's all harping about like the statistics because trying to show whether or not something is effective or harmful is very <laughs> important to the people that's being administered to. So like. I won't cover very much math in this course, but yeah, stats is. <laughs> yeah. So. All right. Um, so something that has been another aspect of sort of like what distinguishes data analysis from data science to me is reproducibility. So if if you hand someone a notebook and say, "I make this claim." Can they go off and either independently or using your notebook reproduce that claim? That's, that's another important feature. It's not just throwing around numbers. It's allowing other people to independently validate that claim. Um, and so there's lots of different ways in which reproducibility manifests. So it's like writing good codes. I'm sorry, writing good codes in your code, posting your your uh, code where other people can see it, maybe licensing it in a way that other people can access it for free. So there's lots of ways of sort of Enabling reproducibility. Um, 
And so often when I say reproducibility, people get this idea of like someone else validates my code. No, they're going to run it and hope that it works, right? And then like they'll, they may or may not tell you there's a bug in it. But most often, I find myself the primary reproducer of my own code. Like if I go back and I have to run my code six months later, it's like telling it to a new person I've never met before, right? So reproducibility applies to yourself. Right. Along that vein, I mentioned that uh, I use free software. That's intentional to make sure that the accessibility is there so that other people can reproduce it, trying to be clear about the license that I'm using, um, like a Creative Commons license, so that other people have, can access it without being in danger illegally. Okay. Um, just so food for thought, basically. This is me loading up sort of your future uh, self about why would reproducibility not work? And it's all good and well to say, like, we should be writing reproducible code. But what are the consequences when we do not do that? And so there's, it's pretty easy. Like, um, it will fail when the assumption is That's, like, the, the most straightforward thing. You'll assume that the user knew something they didn't. That you'll assume that their environment was a certain way. Right. And so assumptions are where most of the, uh, the reproducibility ends up not working out. And this isn't restricted to data science. Like whenever there's an actual sort of like published paper that gets written in the science community, reproducibility is one of the biggest hurdles for like uh, accessing the same raw data they had or reproducing their analysis they did or you know recreating that environment. It's it's not just restricted to data science, it's it's endemic to science. Now we'll get into the exciting part, your homework. Let's take a quick look at the homework. Uh, I wanted to make a few comments. And we'll do the word count. Uh, so this is what, when I say I grade your homework anonymously, these numbers over here, those are like randomly generated numbers that Blackboard provides me. So I can't actually see whose code I'm grading. That's a function. Of, that is a capability of Blackboard. I require it. It's an optional feature. Okay, and all of these, uh, the ones that I have in REF, those are all assignments that I've posted to Blackboard. So again, I'm not crediting the author, but I'm not calling you out either. So just straight off there. They're all, yeah. All right. They may. I will. I'll, I'll verify, and if they're not there, I'll. Oh. All right. So we'll figure it out. All right. So so basically, this is a, a good sample where we have the the exact um, specification of what the assignment was. So some people took the route of rewriting the assignment in their own words, and then in the reinterpretation of the assignment. They didn't get it correct. And then they went and implemented what they had written right, as the assignment. They didn't get full points. So my advice to you is be lazy, copy and paste the text. Then there won't be any question of, you know, did I interpret it correctly? Um, and they have some citations. And they have even hyperlinks in there. And then they have the code uh, with comments. Um, and so this is not to say it's the right one. But it is a way of producing a solution. Okay. Let's see if there's any other excitement here. Yeah, so another solution with more words. Right. So this was not that this is the shortest one, but this is basically about the size of most homework solutions for this assignment. Um, so some people included raw cells with code that they tried but um, didn't want created. So that'd be a foundation there. And then let's see. So this, I like this one because it was very clear about what their plan was. They wrote it down in a raw cell. This is like this is what I'm planning to do, and then they go off and implement it. So that was uh, a good, good approach. And so I don't think they accomplished all these suggestions, but they did put in some like try accept. So I had a request before class to make a video about uh, error handling and exception handling. So I'll post that video to sort of cover method I use in my code on catching errors. Okay. 
Yes, I, I don't know what we'll come back for, but that, those are relevant keywords, certainly. Can you come up with any other questions? Right. I make a presentation. <laughs> All right. So this one, okay. Remember this one, uh, you'll notice it's a very small bar up on top. That's because they're really explicit in walking through all the things that they were thinking in both inline comments, markdown cell comments, trying out things. This was very impressive to me. So like, um, I'm including this one not because it's the most elegant solution, but it was really it conveys what the reader, what the author's intent is. So um, not that you need to reproduce at this level of detail, but it's just sort of like showing you I appreciate this level of content, right? I will read this. This is a quick one. All right, so again, this was about as short as you can this assignment. These assignments were all very small. They were intended to be pretty straightforward. If they're pushing where you're at in code, I'm glad that I provided you some excitement. But the, the goal here was just to sort of like exercise the basics and fundamentals of like functions, and, and in pandas, using the standard command. So this is more, I would say, a warm up. Um, so here, this person used uh, type hinting. So if you've never heard of type hinting, don't feel bad. It's totally cool. Um, as I was explaining before class to a student, type hinting is not something you would normally do in data science, but it would be where you're running up a really large uh, program. The reason you're not using it so much in data science in this class is because uh, we do a lot of exploration, very rapid development, and so we don't really assume that we're going to be reusing the code a bunch. We're just sort of doing a quick exploration. So that's what Project One is all about, like assessing the data, you know, quickly and like telling us what you learned about the data. This would be so type hinting is more relevant. So like when I've got a huge code database that's going to be around for many years, and many people are going to be accessing it and 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 running it. Um, you'll want to be very safe with your code. So type ending isn't that relevant to 601, so I don't think there's any other references to it. All right, and then the last, same to CSV. All right, and I sent out an email on this. Oops, lost it. My, my main sort of like feedback was if you print out the entire data frame, um, that inhibits your ability to sort of like navigate the notebook easily, so don't do that. And then so this is an example of like, I have to scroll all the way through the notebook. So that's why I'm always recommending use head or tail to sort of like see the part you care about, but then like don't spend all of your notebook space um, because it really is about how much mind space it takes to navigate. Okay. The other thing that I, I don't think I included in a reference, but that I called out in email is don't just print the data frame. Yeah. I can't do it with this one. When you print the data frame rather than using like head or tail, it just doesn't look as good, and it's hard to read. So you'll be more you're more likely to miss things. Correct. Not that I'm aware. Yes. Yeah. Oh. Oh. Right. I think that's all I got for that one. Questions on the homework before we move on? Okay. Everybody's happy. Yes. So, so in Python, so there are different so a variable is going to have some content choices. So it's either going to be a list, or a dictionary, or a string, or a set, or a tuple. And so these are all different data types. And basically, the data type is a different way of structuring the way that you think about your data. So, a list of elements and a dictionary and a string and set and are all different ways of looking at uh, the data that you, you care about. So, uh, adding data frame on your problem. So, that's and why do I care, right? So like the relevance of this is um, if I have uh, a collection of all of the names of the students in this class, 
I could represent that as a list. Right? So that'd be maybe the most obvious way of doing that. And each element of that list, being your name, would be a string. Right? So is it appropriate to have every character in your name be an element of a list? Probably not. Right? It's more obvious like this to be a string. It's a collection of characters, so we'll make it a string. But then with the names, it's a list. Right? So when is it right to use one? You sort of have to have this library of types in your head. So that, are you asking about what are the types of Yeah, type typing as an input and the typing is called. So we need to display that. What are the type types for input? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so I can get to it. Okay, so I can get to it. Yeah, perfect. All right. So. So this is type checking. So it's basically, whenever you have a function and you have a set of arguments to the function of the input, you can specify what the type of each of those arguments should be. So that is saying that the list param is going to be of type list. And what I tried to do that in mine, and I didn't understand what it did. Ah, yeah. So it, 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 so if your code is working, nothing should change. Right. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so type hinting is basically only going to throw like a caution flag when it says you passed in a string. Did you mean a list? Right. Why does that matter? What's the value? Yeah. Yeah. So when is it wrong? Or yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Why do we care about type checking? It's because um, usually when you write your function, so let's say I write a function. And that's going to take in a variable. Right. And so something is going to happen in the body of this function. And usually that something depends on some assumption about what variable type this is. Right. So if I said for element in var b, So, so this function will work if I pass in a list, right? Because it's going to loop over every element in the list and print the element. So far, so good, right? What if I pass in, uh, say, a string? This will still work. And the reason it will still work is because it's going to take the string and loop over every character in the string. Okay? If it's a set, the set will also work because it's just going to uh, iterate over every element in the set, right? But if you pass in a data frame, this won't work. So at least I don't think it will work. <laughs> right up. Um, I think it would work. But so then, if, if you did something different, like let's say, yeah, you could do that. More likely, I can. You see something like this. So this loop is uh, is implicitly assuming that var b is a dictionary, and it's going to get all the element, uh, all the keys in that dictionary, and return them here. So this will be all the keys in your dictionary. But if you're to uh, run this where it was a list, then it would complain and say, I can't access the items in a list because that's not a valid function for a list. Now I know my question. That's not a very valuable way, or legitimate way of doing error checking, then, except for the programmer, not for the customer. That uh, because when I did do it wrong, it bounced. Yeah. You get the big red square or the yeah. rectangle. You yeah. don't want that, and the customer doesn't want that. They right. something that works. Yeah. So <laughs> this is a good question of like, who is the customer for a, well, a notebook? Someone, right. someone comes to you and says, I want something done in the notebook. Yeah, it's 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 a guard against yourself how you're using your code. Yeah. Does that answer your question, Okay. This was a good digression. <laughs> uh, let's see. Right. So we're gonna do basically getting data from computers, and then later in the course, getting data from people. It's like the mirror coming. Right. So you're probably used to getting 
the information from the internet via the web page, right? Everybody, I'm not going to even ask for raise of hands because I hope everyone has done that. So I will embarrass you if you have not. And the way that you do that is you typically have like Opera or Firefox or Internet Explorer or what's the new Edge? Like those are the web browsers that most people use. There's links and other ones, right? But um, so that's how you're used to seeing content, sort of like visually with pretty pictures and colors, but and sometimes text and numbers. So the problem is, so well, you know, welcome to big data. When I search for UMBC, um, it turns out that Google thinks there's about 174,000 websites on the UMBC domain. So that's a lot, right? It means that as a human, I would have a really hard time visiting every single one of those web pages because I would add, you know, after about 50, I get pretty bored. So, so the problem is, and, and this is just UMBC, right? UMBC is a really small school in Maryland, in the United States. The internet's really big. And so the problem is like Google has trillions of web pages. So clearly they didn't have lots of people. Well, I hope they didn't have lots of people clicking on web pages, right? They did some what did they do? All right. So <laughs> I'm not claiming that I know how Google's technology works, but I have a pretty good feeling that I at least know where they started. Okay. Um, <laughs> so there's lots of different ways to get access to data, and we're gonna cover a lot of these today, not all of them. Like, for instance, papers and books, when you scan things, that's not going to be part of this, but might be part of your data science or your uh, machine learning class. But the point of me referencing all of these is that you should have some method in your head of extracting data at scale from any resource. That's because your customers are going to show up with all of these. Right? So they're typically not going to say, here's a well formatted electronic CSV that I cleaned up for you. Here you go, data scientist. That is just not how the real world works, right? You're going to be like, here's a stack of papers. Have a good weekend. And you're like, I don't want to read those, right? <laughs> now if you, right. All right. So in order to have a little conversation about how the internet works, we're going to have to learn some technology words. And so it's not crucial for your existence as a data scientist to know all these words, but it's a good exposure to have a little bit of insight as to what's going on when you click on my mouse. Okay, and the joke here is, how do I internet? Of course you do, right? Or can I internet? Of course you do. It's a joke. Okay. So as I warned you, there's some new words coming. Um, so basically, the idea is most of you are considered a client, and when you go to a web page, what that really means is you're going to some other remote computer that you don't see or think about very much, but it's called a server. Right, and the server is the thing that hosts the content that you're requesting. So we could put words on this, right? We could request content from a server, and then it responds with something. Those are the actual words we use, right? So that's pretty straightforward. It's serving content. You're requesting it. There's a response. Okay, so <laughs> the relevance here, not just um, like the, you know, because I like drawing pretty pictures, but because being able to speak the language allows you to search for the things you don't understand. So I'm trying to arm you with words so you can go Google these later yourself. OK, so when I say like you get a, re a response from a server, what does that actually look like, right? There's actually ones and zeros going on on the computer somewhere, I hope. Um, and so it, it's pretty complicated. And this will be about all the slides you get for it. Basically, all those things that are coming back, those are packets. They basically send out little bits of information from chunks or packets. And they contain a bunch of different stuff. All the things that get rendered on your computer are in those packets. And so when that gets you know, transmitted electronically, it shows up as ones and zeros. And then those get uh, transmitted to hex codes. And then the hex codes get translated into actual like words that you can understand. And this is super cool because it's all written. Uh, so this is all accessible using a program that is free. So you can actually see what your computer is doing when it talks to a remote server using Wireshark. Is anyone here used or heard of Wireshark? One. All right. So I'm providing some education then for some people. <laughs> All right. so, so basically, if you're not familiar with like HTML and CSS and JavaScript, welcome. Those are useful words for browsing the web. And that's how your web pages are being uh, rendered. But all of that is sort of like writing on top of another layer of technology of packets and like information being transmitted through um, your computer. So there's, there's basically many layers of protocols to think about. And then, again, back to the relevance, why do I care? Well, if you're in the cybersecurity domain, 
this is really important because this is where all your viruses come in and where your attacks come in. And so like being able to see this rather than waiting for your computer to crash is more useful. But if you're not in the cybersecurity domain, this is still useful to be aware of because typically um, when you have a problem at one sort of abstraction layer, the trick is to go down one. Does that make sense? So like if, if, if I'm thinking about my web page isn't quite working the way I think it should, what should I do? Right? Either give up, which is one option, or go down one layer in the abstraction stack and say, like, am I actually receiving packets associated with that web page? And if I'm not, that's the problem, right? So if you only know sort of one layer of the abstractions, you can't really debug. So you have to be have some awareness of what's going on below the the thing that you see. Right. So <laughs> as I sort of warned you, like there's a whole sequence of steps going on behind the scenes that are hidden from you. And typically that's a good thing because most of us aren't data scientists, so we don't have to worry about this. But now you're a data scientist and you do have to sort of have some idea of when I click on a thing, what happens? I click on a web page, it goes to a link. What's really happening is there's some um, requests being sent to a remote server. Then that server recognizes your request, sends you back to the content. And so there's this whole sequence of steps. And the better you, again, the better you can diagnose, how is this going to work if I do 10,000 of them? Or how is this going to work if, if something goes wrong? Right. So like having some contextual knowledge is useful. <laughs> and again, I'm just layering all these words out here so that if you're like, oh man, I never had any idea. How would I even search for more knowledge about what I've been described? Well, here's some more keywords. Okay. Right. So again, um, this is just sort of more of an advertisement for, for Wireshark. You can actually see all the commands that are being run in the background on your computer when you visit a web page. That is, to me, super cool and exciting. But I'm a nerd. Right. So you can like see that and then up here the top section these are all the this individual packets being sent to your computer from the remote server so um, I'm source destination so usually the source right that'll be the server remotely the destination of the U or if it's going to the way it's switched up questions anybody like is blown away curious you hit Hannah Almost. They're almost. It's a very good question. So her question was, are those GPS coordinates? They're actually called IP addresses. Uh, let's make one. Sort of like blue for this. Basically, there's a protocol, internet protocol. Right? It's the IP address, and it's a numeric identifier for every computer on the internet. So every computer, yours and everyone else's, has an IP address. Maybe IP address 4 or 6. But there's some way of identifying your computer. And there's some way of identifying the server. And those are the names. We typically don't think about those because what we say is like HTTP colon slash slash w, you know, www.google.com. What that really is is just a human sort of string identifier on top of that numeric ID. So yeah, numeric ID is what matters. Does that answer the question? OK. So these IP addresses, <laughs> it's sort of, it should boggle your mind, right? Like every computer on the internet has an IP address. And you can enumerate all those IP addresses, right? So now let's say, oh, I've got a, a CSV of every IP address on the internet. Right, <laughs> right? Like that means I could write a computer program to generate every IP address. Wait a minute. <laughs> what could I do with that? Right? Like now you, you really start thinking, right? Like that's good times. By the way, the, if you want to like, have a fun, boring exercise, you can just type up a Python notebook to generate every IP address. Right? How many of there's like 256, 256, 256, 256. That's how many there are, right? So that's how many IPs. You can enumerate that into a CSV. It's not that large. <laughs> All right. So now we're going to, so I just did the deep dive on the internet. We're no longer going to think about that, right? We're going to go back to the good old safe URLs, right? So let's stick with those a little bit. So I'm going to use a couple tools here. And we're going to request a web page, but we're not going to use a web browser. I'm very intrigued, right? <laughs> this is pretty exciting stuff. How are we going to get a web page without using a web browser? So this gets us the scraping data. We will take a break. And we'll come back at 8. OK. Have a scrum certification. I'm not, I'm not a software developer. Sure. 
funny that you have to see a word that's what these guys like curl. Yeah, yeah. yeah. talk about absolutely. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> we'll do APIs tonight. Oh, except the rest of APIs. Yeah. <laughs> this is useful. <laughs> Is it is Scrum your only? Is this Scrum Master your only position? Like, is that your full time job? No. Okay. I'm going to Scrum Master full time. We can't really do this. It's only one thing. No, we 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 Scrum every day. But only 15 minutes. I have to meet that when you guys get because they'll talk. Yeah. But one thing we do if I do do this was my only invention that they did. It's when I set it up. I said. I'm doing only 50 people stand and do it. They don't do it. But we're kind of remote. Okay. It says we're going to stand. You can only go 50 minutes. I'll keep time. Okay. Since we have everyone together and it's effective to have everyone together, it's at the end. Okay. Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah
but the bird will not find it. So it's terrible. But you would, you would pass it not. So in one initialized variable is not the same as the So it was complaining probably about the fact that it's going to initialize, which is distinct from you catching the numbers. Or you can just say that we're not. Okay. Okay. <laughs> All right, so let's get started again. All right, so when I talk about scraping data, this is the first thing you should think about. Is it legal? <laughs> and just because you've never thought about whether something is legal or not doesn't mean you won't go to jail. So this is me sort of like, I'm not a lawyer, but I'm telling you, you should be aware of the repercussions of your actions. So it's not simply enough to say, I didn't know there was a law about this. Like that, the law doesn't care whether you do or not, you have to be prosecuted. <laughs> Again, this will hopefully, like when you're doing something new, it's worth asking, are there any regulations that cover this? In my company, are there policies? Are there state laws? Are there federal laws? Right? Those are good things to ask before starting any project. That's why in project one, I asked, is your data legally accessible? And the reason this becomes an issue is because usually content is posted to the internet so that people can access it. No big deal, right? The problem becomes when someone, question? No. So, so the question, be, uh, the, the problem becomes when someone is asking for all of your data, right? If I say like, can you give me this web page? And then the server says, yep, here's the web page, right? That's a normal behavior. But when I say, could you give me every single listing on eBay? eBay's servers are like, uh, no. So like businesses want to protect what they're doing. Um, and sometimes, uh, that automation can run into a, uh, either legal policies that are actual law or company policies. So I'm going to open up this link here. So this is a website, 50states.com. The website's not important. The fact that they have some legal disclaimer about what it is they're actually offering on their website, that's, that's to me very unusual. Like if you see a website that has some like legal policy, <laughs> it's because they went off and hired a lawyer. Right, typically, and hiring lawyers are cheap, so therefore they were trying to protect something. And so what they're really doing is sort of like setting up their defenses so that if you do something naughty, they can say you didn't, you violated our website website policy. You typically won't see this on a website. You will see this in like a terms of service agreement for signing up for some service, right? So like when you sign up for an email account or like the university, there's some like terms of service to which you're agreeing by using a service. And so again, it's good to, before you sort of apply your data science skill set of give me all the data, right, it's good to see like, does that violate anything in the terms of service or a legal agreement? But again, most websites will not have this available. Okay, so the reason it is expensive to the, uh, to the hosting is not just because they have to go hire lawyers, but because it consumes things that they pay money for, right? Like it may be free for you to ask for all the data from their website but it is certainly not free for them to give you all that data. They have to pour the bandwidth and the computers and making sure um, you know, their website is protected against uh, attacks. So this is sort of like the cost to hosting a website. Okay. So the more com so what I was just showing you is a legal agreement. More commonly, what you'll see is called a robots.txt. Okay, so let's go to a robots.txt like this one, just to get us started with a clear example. That was a joke because robots.txt is not clear. Okay. So this is meant to be read by a computer. When a computer goes to standard.edu, maybe you've heard of them, right? so they have a website, and they're putting this robots.txt in place so that if your automated data collection process goes to standard.edu, it should check robots.txt. So this is a way for the website to say, our policy on data collection is, and then it lists everything. And so basically they have, the, this is all specialized format. So like you have user agent star, like that, we'll come back to it. It does allow, allow, allow. And then in the bottom here, it's got a bunch of disallow. And when I make a prediction about what this is, what this is doing here. 
from someone who has not gone yet? Who's got a response? Isabel. But more specifically, what website you can access? Yeah. Okay. So that's all good. So now let's go up to that user agent thing as I come back to. So, what is a user agent? So, basically, the user agent is a thing associated with your web browser. So, your web browser, when you click on, I want to go to this web page, your web browser sends a request to a server. In addition to your IP address and the request, it also sends an identifying user agent string. So, on my computer, when I click on a website, the information that's sent to the server is Mozilla 5.0, Macintosh, Intel, NASA, blah, 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 right? All this good stuff. And you're like, what is going on there, right? I have a Mac that's, that's this, right? It's running, I think, for all Firefox. And so it's all this information is hidden there. And you're like, why would I send that revealing information to the server? And the answer is because sometimes the server will display different content based on what type of computer you have or what type of web browser you have. And most often, this comes up in the form of like, am I using Internet Explorer or Chrome or Firefox? Sometimes the web page is rendered differently. And so this is a way for your computer to tell the server what kind of computer they're sending the data to. Well, the IP address doesn't tell them what kind of web browser it is. Yeah. OK. So you're like, don't care. User agent strings, never seen it, don't care about it. Right? Well, here's the problem. So when you're, when the application that you write goes off to a server and says, hey, send me all of your data, the computer be like, uh, who are you? Like, what's your IP address? Like, that's kind of like name, right? But the other thing is, like, what's your, what's your user agent string? And so this is where we get into the, the gray area of, well, I could tell the server that I'm a Chrome web browser running a Mac OS, you know, computer. And then I'll get all the content back for that web browser. And so typically, when we're using pandas, that's not the user agent string. And so sometimes we'll run into problems where I send a pandas request to a web page, and it says, that's not a browser I recognize. I'm not sending anything back. So then you have to play around with these games of, OK, which user agent strings does the remote server recognize and send data back? So it gets kind of, it's down in the weeds, right? But the reason you need to care about it is if you're trying to, at scale, get all this data, you need to understand why it didn't work out. All right, and then, yeah, so that's that. All right, so now we're going to do a little discussion activity. So we've talked a little bit about the ethics of web scraping, why it costs the web server host, and sort of like what problem that might be. So again, let's talk to your neighbor. This will be a quick exercise for about a minute. So form groups of three this time. Self-select groups of three. formed an opinion, right? My question for you is, does it matter? So this is the first question. Is the data collection acceptable if you only collect some of the data, or is it acceptable if you collect all the data? So your hand if you think it's OK to collect some of the data off of a website. Two, three, four, one, two, three, four, five. 
So I'm saying like there's two choices. One is to collect some of the data, and the other is to collect all of the data. So right now I'm asking how many people think it's okay to collect some data. They didn't ask that question. Well, we have to do one of the two, right? One of the two. So uh, <laughs> right. Okay, so, so we're already down this rabbit hole of what's the purpose, what's the intent, which website are we on, blah, blah, right? Okay, so we're already on this question, which is, does the purpose of the collection matter, right? Yeah. Or who are we collecting from? Does that matter, right? Maybe I'm doing this out of the, you know, for very good purposes but from websites that are very bad. Maybe that matters, right? So the whole point of this is it gets very angry and no one agrees, right? And so imagine you're a data scientist and you're representing in court to a judge with a lawyer, right? And you're having this debate. Is that the debate you want to be having? Probably not. So it's worth thinking about this before you get to that stage. Right? So think about how am I going to resolve this? Maybe I could just go talk to the website owner and give me all the data on a floppy disk. Fine, solves the problem, right? That was a joke. Floppy disk can't handle any data. <laughs> all right. So, all right. So an example of sort of like you know questionable ethics. Sort of like this isn't all just like whiteboarding. It's actual manifest in the real world. So there is a website called OKCupid. If you haven't heard of it, it's where people get together and find relationships and fall in love. Right? Dating website. So they'll host, <laughs> they'll hope they'll, each person registers for OKCupid who wants to find a mate. And then they go off and say like, you know, my name is this, here's my picture, here's my age, here's the things I'm interested in, here's the things I don't like, here's the part I'm looking for, blah, blah, right? That's cool, that's how you run a dating website. So, so someone off, went off just sort of like, prove that they can go off and they collect 70,000 users of dating uh, profiles from OkCupid. So is this wrong? In some sense, as a user, I could visit any of those 70,000 profiles and get that data, right? But probably you weren't expecting when you posted a profile on OkCupid that all of your data would be aggregated with all the other people on OkCupid and then like analyzed in bulk. Right? So again, it probably violated the terms of service for OkCupid. OkCupid didn't intend their website to be used that way. But the technology is there, and you can go off and, and write that application yourself and scrape all the data off OkCupid. And so your technical capability has now been greatly expanded, and so in some sense, so has your responsibility to act correctly. Not that I'm, yeah, go ahead. <laughs> Depends on which website you're going to. Mm -hmm. And and so typically, so for this course, again, there's sort of like the legal question of is it you know legal and is it free? But um because we're only getting like say a megabyte worth of data, this isn't something we typically trigger in terms of you know, we're not downloading all of Amazon, we're just gonna get a CSV. So it's typically not too much of an issue specifically in six oh one. Okay. So now we've talked and talked and talked, so how do we actually do this? All right, so let's go up to this website called www.biogam.com without opening a web browser. It's excited, all right, everybody's excited. I'll close that one. Uh, I'll open up a new one. Okay, so I'm gonna open up a terminal. If you're running Windows, you probably don't have this command installed by default. I'm not sure if it's in uh, Mac by default, um, and it's probably available pretty easily in Linux. So my ability to do this is because I'm on the computer I'm on, and it may not be reproducible in yours, but um, certainly software that's available for free. Okay. Dot fog, is it fog cam? Dot work. Yes. Okay. So I'm going to type in this command on the terminal, which you've seen, I think, in week one or two. And it goes off and does all this stuff, and you're just like, huh. Computers, right? How do they work? There's a bunch of text. It's clearly not the web page, right? So we did something wrong. But actually, so if you read through this, it's actually pretty readable, right? So it's looking for fogcam.org. They found Anna. Whoop, whoop. All right. So it's going to connect to that server, right? I can actually narrate this story basically, right? This is the log of what happened, all the actions that are taking place. So it's pretty readable. Okay, so it found that, and then it's connecting to the server, and it says it's connected. And then it's sending a request in HTTP, so hypertext, hypertext transfer protocol. It does the, the request format. Um, and then it's getting some content back called index.html. Who is excited to look at index.html? 
this is pretty cool, right? So, so let's look at what we've got. So probably download it down over here. Is that not in the right directory? There it is. Okay, so let's see what this is. This is a bunch of stuff. Okay, so right, this. So Vincent has recognized that this content returned to us is actually a web page. And if you opened it up in a web browser, it would manifest as something that looks like this. Uh, and, uh, okay, so this is what the web page normally looks like. But that's not what we saw, right? We saw a bunch of sort of like gobbledygook with different colors. This is called hypertext markup language. So this is the text formatting that your web browser receives from the, from the remote server. And then your web browser takes this and renders it as this, right? So that's pretty exciting. That's how your computer is actually getting this web page. It gets this HTML dot uh, index that HTML and then shows you this. So, right. And if so, I didn't actually show you this, but basically, if you have this file and you open it with, not this will work or not. Yes. All right. So something went wrong here, right? We got the web page, but it's not the thing we expected. It's because our local copy of that file, which is close, doesn't actually have the connection back to the original server. So even though we have the content, it's missing that live sort of cam feed. So our, snat our static offline copy of the website isn't a live cam feed. You should be reassured by that. But all of that content, as HTML is displayed back, so that's what that is. Okay. All right. Questions on that? That's like a really fast introduction to a uh, WK. Yeah, that's right. So there's thoughts. There's a bunch of different error codes, and you those are all referenced. So, but you're like Ben. You talked about big data and like you know UMBC has 140,000 websites. What happened? We just did one. So that means that there are command line uh, arguments to wget, like dash r, which are recursive, and it travels all of the things on all every web page. And so, like, if you had this web page, like Fogham, and it has web links on it, what you probably really wanted to do was follow each one of these links from this web page to get all of the content from the website, right? So that's a command line switch to wget. Uh, yeah. And so, <laughs> my advice is if you're if you're Downloading an entire website, which is totally cool, use the dash M for viewing, right? And then rate limit. So you want to make sure that you don't say just, hey, server, give me all the data. Because right? that will like crash the remote computer sometimes. That's a bad thing to do. What you probably want to do is say, like, hey, can you give me this web page? And uh, you know, a few seconds later, uh, can you give me this web page? And then a few seconds later, give it this web page. Right? So you're sort of like spacing out your request so that you don't overwhelm the remote server. This is a tip because it's much less likely to cover uh, to trigger bad events on the remote server. Okay, safety. Huh? It's a website. Yeah. That's the, the location of the website. Okay, so I just showed you a bunch of things in the terminal. The relevance there is that's where wget started out. Luckily, some nice person went ahead and took the wget command and put it into a Python package. Which means you can write a Python script to use wget. You don't even have to leave and go to the terminal. You can just run it all from right within Python. That's super cool. Okay, so wget is where you normally start. Curl is what you typically use. Right? So curl is basically going to do the same thing. So let's go back and just use it quickly so we know what it's looking like. Okay. So I'm going to do curl www.fogcam.org. I'm in the terminal. Yeah, okay. So the terminal is not Python. It's got a dollar sign here. Okay, so I ran the curl command against the same uh, URL, and I did not get back the thing that I got before. Right? Clearly, this is not cool. And if you read it, it looks like HTML. If you're familiar with hypertext markup language, you'll recognize these as tags. And you can even read this without having to import it as a web page. It says the document has moved, blah blah blah. You're like, huh? All right. Well, let's let's give this a try. This time, yeah. Okay. So now it just spit back a whole bunch of stuff. 
that looks kind of familiar. It's not quite as pretty, but it's the same thing as what we had over here, except it didn't get saved to a file. That's just a, like a stylistic difference. Basically, curl is outputting the same content to the screen rather than to a file. That's like a minor difference, but sometimes shifts people up. So why does this, why do we care about curl? Well, because if you go back to the slides, so what we were doing um, with wget and with curl in this example was HTTP, like hypertext transfer protocol. That's why you're requesting a web page. But curl supports a whole bunch of other different protocols. So that's super nice. Use a couple of these throughout the semester. So curl is typically the way you send commands to a remote server on the command line. And obviously, there was PyCurl. So you never even have to leave Python. Think of this, right? So, so you, can, you can use Python and then have your data in a data frame. You can use pandas. And you can get data using PyCurl, right? Or the request libraries, which we'll use in this one. So like, you can do all of your data analysis in this one environment. It makes the integration very easy. If you had to switch between different tools, that makes it a little bit more complicated. So the fact that you can do this all in Python, that's of value. Okay. So uh, as I just alluded, there's another library that I'll be referencing called requests. Absolutely. That's why it's very powerful. Right? It's, it's just, so it's like, it's usually called like a glue language. So like it has a bunch of functionality and it can combine all those functionalities in one thing. So like operating in this one environment can be pretty powerful. Yeah. Okay. I'm gonna close these. And I think this, this one. Okay. Uh, it's the PowerShell in, in Windows. Okay, so I'm going to use this notebook here. So I warned you there's a library called request, so we have to import it. Okay. Now, here's the fun part. So rather than typing all that stuff in terminal, which is sort of one complaint that I might have is like if you're typing a command in JIT or curl on the command line, you saw that happen, but there is no sort of real record of it. And so the value of you know doing things in Python here is that this notebook has the command very explicitly documented, right? So that when I need to go back and run the notebook again, the command is all there. So again, not switching context has some some useful value here. So I'm going to use the request library. It has a function called get. It's pretty straightforward. You pass the URL, right? So here's you can open up this URL to see what it looks like. Shouldn't be too surprising. It's a big old CSV. Right? So that's a CSV in a web page, not super useful. But since we know the URL, we can pass that into a request. I'm going to save the response as the variable the response. All right. So now let's look at that type. It's a type we haven't seen before. Right? And that's a little confusing. Um, so it's, it's a type that's specific to this module. So it has its own little types. Uh, associated with this module. So that means we're going to have to be able to access this data in a way that's specific to the module. So I happened to look that up before class, and there's a response.txt that gives you the content of the request. And then I'm going to take that text and split it on a new new line character, and it looks pretty much like what we got on the web page. So this should hopefully boggle your mind. Right? We just went from seeing a URL with a web page as a CSV, and now we've got it as a huge giant string in Python. <laughs> That's cool. That's right. There's some, some more work that needs to be done. Request is not the end of the story. OK. Now let's go off and do things that are a little crazier, right? We just showed you a list. <laughs> the, the, the response in your face was priceless. So I'm going to go off and I'm going to grab this URL. Has anyone seen that before? That's good. So you sort of know what it looks like. I don't have to go there, right? So I got back. I can check the response status, and it's OK. And so now let's look at that text in that, right? Because last time when we did the text, we got back this giant old thing, which looked pretty reasonable. That's right. We went to the, the front page of Wikipedia, and we got back this huge problem. Ego. That's the problem. This is clearly not the thing we care about, right? Like, I hope not, at least. It's a big, long string. 
So if you recognize the first little bit there, it says doc type HTML. Okay, hopefully you've seen this like terms by now, you're starting to recognize that's HTML. That's how the web page is being manifested to us on the computer, but that's not how we typically see it. Okay. So, and, and, and you think, okay, so that's like, just put that in the back of your head as like a problem to be solved, because we'll get back to that. Okay. And I'm gonna take you sort of like this intermediate stage of like, it looks accessible, but it's not. And what I mean by that is like, here's a web page I go to, um, for whatever reason, they have a list of names, and for whatever reason, maybe I care about this. And so, the easy question is, Ben, how do I get this list that's very visible on a web page into a, a, a data structure that I can work with in Python? And so the first step, yeah. So, so again, it's not super easy. I'm just warning you, so you can get the content, and you can sort of see here, like it's got those things that we saw on the web page, but it's not in the format that we need, right? And so it's got the thing we care about, but it means we're gonna have to do a little extra work to get it into a format that we can work with. So all that I'm just advertising, request is a usually a great place to start for getting data, but you have to do more work in order to convert it into the thing you care about. Questions so far on getting data. Perhaps. All right. All right. Last thing I'm just going to show it out. I'm not going to show you. Um, it's called Scrappy. Or Scrappy, however you want to pronounce it. I like Scrappy. So, Scrappy is a way of uh, writing what's called a spider. So, a spider is what Google uses to get all your web pages. So, basically, this whole process of like getting a web page, getting every link from that web page, getting every other web page that that links to, right? That's like a really complicated job. And so if you write that Python from scratch, it'd be a lot of work. So luckily, somebody bundled all that work up of like scraping the entire internet, and they wrote a program, and they created a module called Scrappy. So if you wanted to go off and like reproduce Google's effort, this would be a reasonable place to start. It's clearly Google's done more work because they've hired thousands of engineers, but this is about you know the common standard. Okay. <laughs> I'm not expecting an here to use Scrappy, which is why I'm not going to spend time on it. So hopefully, um, if you haven't done this before, this is a really quick activity. I'm going to have you, this is like a solo activity now, go to a web page, which I happen to choose as umbc.edu. Right? This is a web page you're used to seeing. And I want you to do something else with your web browser. So it depends on which web browser, and I'll use a couple of them. So if I do a view, tools, this one, yeah. So on Firefox, if you're in Firefox, and you go to tools, and then web developer and page source, you can see the source code of every web page on the internet in your web browser. Using the tools that you already have, a web browser, this is the content. So if, you're, if you want to get started and you're like cruising around after class and you're like, I wonder what the source code for this web page looks like, you can see it. It's really cool. Like, and, and the reason this is neat is because Let's say there's something on this website that I really like, like this one picture. How do I get that one picture? Well, the source code for where that one picture is located is in this HTML code. And you can do that for any web page. Okay. So anybody have any questions about like Chrome, Internet Explorer, or raise board? All right. Hannah. Sure. Chrome coming up. Let's go to umbc.edu. In Chrome. Oh, huh? Yeah. Uh, huh? More tools. And then developer tools, I don't think. Oh, okay. Well, that's not quite what I wanted to see. I think it's under view, and then developer, and then view source. So on Chrome, it's view, developer, view source. And hopefully, it should be the same content that we saw last time. Okay. okay. So if you don't know HTML, it's actually a very useful language to invest some effort in learning. It's a good thing. Uh, so if you go to on the top here, view. Ah, okay. 
Okay. So if you have questions, I'm happy to answer after class. We've got a lot to get through, so I'm going to go back to the slides. Okay. So as I sort of getting the web page is not sufficient. You actually have to interpret all of the HTML to get the structured data that you care about. So now let's introduce a new library called Beautiful Soup. This will be what you use over and over. So um, all of these notebooks will be posted on Blackboard, but this is a, a quick sort of verbal tutorial. Okay. So I'm going to import a module DS4 from Beautiful Soup. And so this, the intent of this little demo here is to say that Beautiful Soup is completely independent of the request or wget referral library. So the act of getting the content is distinct from analyzing the content. So in order to like really show that out, I have a string here, and the string contains HTML. And so I'm not using request or wget to get the content. I'm just saying this is some content. So we're going to analyze this content as a string. It's normally how request returns it. But I'm just saying like this library um, is independent of the act of getting it. OK, so here's the fun part. It's pretty straightforward. So beautiful soup, I pass in the variable that contains the string containing all the HTML, and I say what I want to do with it. I want to use the HTML parser. OK, so now we've just loaded that into the soup variable. That's pretty standard. And now soup has a bunch of attributes that we can access. And so the first thing I usually throw on our web is the title. Right? So the title. Where did that come from? Well, if we look back here, again, HTML is pretty straightforward. We've got a start tag there of HTML, and then there's a head and a close head here. And all the things in there is the title. With the start and end tag. So when I access that data structure, those tags, what I'm really asking for is show me the tags with the title for, for that data structure. Okay, and if I don't want to include the tags, then I can just say uh, that string. So that's now the thing that I cared about. And I didn't have to write an HTML parser. That's really good. You should never write an HTML parser. You should always use the web. Because you'll if you try and write a parser, a thing that like analyzes the HTML code, you'll get it wrong. HTML is pretty complicated. Okay. There's some more fun things we can do. So for instance, uh, let's see, I'm gonna get back all of the things that end with uh, have an A tag. So the reason A tags are interesting is because I have like a, a paragraph start here, and then I have an A href. If you are familiar with HTML, A href is the, uh, the reference, the hyperlink reference to this. And when it renders on your web page, you'll see this. So this is the text. And then the reason that's blue and underscored is because you're going to go to this website. So typically, when you go to a website, you want to say, what are all the links that I could go to from this web page? So you'd be looking for all the A tags. So here's a for loop that says, what are all the A tags in my, in, my, in my data structure? Here are all the links. Right. Yeah. And so the, the main keys are like the tags. Yeah. And, and knowing the title and the body and the A href keys. Right. So, Yep. Um, and so now why would I care about extracting all the links from this web page? Well, probably because if I am asking for, please give me this web page, I want to see what are all the follow-on links in that web page. And so you can do that by saying, like, here's the HTML back. What are all the A tags in there? And when you extract all the text, from, all the links from that, that A href, those are the places you would go if you clicked on a link in a web page. So you could sort of, like, now you can start thinking about OK, I can download a web page. I can click on all the links on the web page. I can go and go all to all the web pages uh, for this site. OK, I get excited. All right, so the next thing is, now we've got some HTML. We can parse it. What are we going to do with it? And let's get back here. All right, so now we want to do two things. We want to combine uh, request with Beautiful soup. We're going to parse what we're getting back, and then we're going to extract tables out of that. Uh, this is a thing that I don't quite understand. I think there's like a class within a module. Yeah. 
Yeah, but is it like a function like this? It's a class within that module, right? Yeah, yeah, I, I agree with you, but I'm not sure the exact structure. I, I don't have an answer for that one. How you would know to do this? Google. <laughs> Why are you doing it? I don't have an answer. Okay. That's that part about I'm not. A yeah, but then you need it. So when you call the function, then it'd be like beautiful soup dot bs four dot soup. So the way that you call the function then changes. Okay. So I'm gonna go off. I'm gonna get this web page. Basically, it's not too exciting, but we'll notice that there is a table on this web page. And what we're really trying to do is grab this table off the web page. Right, so this is a very reasonable task to be assigned as a data scientist. Give me all the tables off of this website. Vincent. Sometimes, yes. That, that is not the only route. So, for instance, my friend is writing a web crawler which gets all the websites on the internet. And then, like, you as a human necessarily know what's on all of those websites. And so, therefore, your parser has to be more uh, capable of handling things that you've never seen before. So, like, like, this is a reasonable task. It's pretty straightforward. Like, I know there's a table, therefore, I should be able to extract the table. Um, sometimes even that's hard. Like, like, if you as a human see, a construct on the on the on the page, and then you go into Beautiful Soup, and you're like, that doesn't show up anywhere here, right? It it it's super messy. People are bad at developing websites, and sometimes they're actively trying to defend their content. Okay, so I'm gonna go off, grab that web page. It looks like I got something back, so that's a good thing. Okay, so now we can do basically the exact same thing I just showed you, which is I'm gonna take the HTML content from that, parse it as HTML, save it to a variable called Soup, and I'm gonna uh, Display that HTML content, but I'm going to use the prettify. The prettify is pretty nice because it actually just makes that not just like one long string, but like a bunch of text that's well stated, well formatted. So I can actually read it a little bit. The reason that's useful is that can we can sort of like answer Vincent's question of like, is the data actually there? Did we get the thing we care about back? Right. So like if I look through all these tags, again, I don't know all the tags, right? Like. I may have seen HTML and head, but I've never seen meta before. And I don't know what script is. So like, yes, there will be some things that you don't care about and don't understand in HTML, but try and pull out the things we do. Sorry? This, this is the same thing that we would get if we looked at the source code of this web page. The difference is we currently have it in a variable in Python. Right. So now the reason I'm sort of like manually skimming through this code for the page is because I actually want to verify that the code that I'm interested in is present in this HTML, right? So like so far, I've seen US state abbreviations as a title. That's good. It means I'm probably on the right web page. But I haven't seen, what am I looking for? I'm looking for all the states and the state abbreviations, right? So I haven't seen that yet. So I'm not really confident that it's there yet. OK, so I'm going to keep scrolling through, blah, 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 blah. blah, blah. Oh, oh, look, 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 look at that. We got states and we got abbreviations. And they're hidden in some like weird HTML, right? But we're at we're at a good point because we know that the data is present in the HTML. So now the challenge becomes, how do you extract this apparent table from the web page? Right? That's the challenge. Okay, so I'm gonna collapse that whole big blob of text, a little blue bar there. Okay, so now I'm gonna ask. So we have a variable called soup containing all the HTML, and I can ask it. Can you tell me where all the tables are? I think a really straightforward question, right? So let's just do that. All right, so it says that the thing that was returned, every table, is a length of two. Sounds like a list of tables, doesn't it? That says a list. There were two tables. But I'm really a little confused, because they're like, I only see one, right? No, it's not the two columns. So it's the fact that there are, there are actually two HTML tables on this web page. But one of them is this big visible thing, and the other is a hidden table where it's structured. Um, it's not a visible table. So the HTML has um, rendered it uh, as a title and like the rest of the table as a cell. So it's a little messy. So basically, we're going to fall in the trap momentarily. Okay. So I'm going to ask for that list of size two, what is the zeroth element? 
Okay, I get back a whole bunch of stuff that's clearly not the thing I care about, right? So there were two HTML tables in the source code. One of them is not visible. It happens to be the first table. All right, all right. Vincent's on, on the job. All right, blah, 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 blah. All right, look at that. We've got names and abbreviations. So we're super excited because we think we've solved the problem, right? There's a little caveat there. All right. So that's not the thing we want. And then so we're going to do, so let's just as a little exploration. So the way HTML tables are laid out is they have, um, so here's a table, that's tag opener, that's the start of the table. And then we've got this TR and TH, so it's a table row, table header. And then TD is table data. So again, back to like what tags are relevant. Typically we're parsing HTML for tables. And so we look for those stars and TDs. Right, so this is like a quirk of HTML is that the rows are declared and then there are table datas within every row. So they don't explicitly call out columns, they only call out rows and elements within the row. Right, it's a little high scratcher. Okay, so the data is there and so we can ask, um, what are all the things in the TR? So that's the table rows. And if we look at the first return from that, so we got back on um, this data structure table rows. The zeroth element of that list is state and abbreviation. That should look familiar because it's the top of the table. Good news, right? All right. Prediction. <laughs> no, it's good. All right. So, so now, so we've got the, the the table, and what we really want, we don't care about these tags. We can uh, take the strings out of that. Let's see. So um, I was going to try and throw all of this into pandas, just as is. Like, we know it's uh, tables and columns, and so we can try that. But even though pandas has this green HTML, something broke. All right, so my, my attempt at using pandas to read the HTML failed, so that's a problem. All right, so if we look at the, oops, why is my page kind of not? Mm. I wonder if something went wrong. Lexamo not found. All right. I neglected to install a library. Let's see if that helps. My apologies for not doing that before. So I knew that I needed, so the error at the bottom of the message down here was Lexamil not found. Please install it. So then I always install my libraries at the top of the notebook. So I went up to the top of the notebook and I used pip, because pip is my package manager, not conda. And I'm using the exclamation to get back to the, the shell, the outside, and say, yeah, yes, conda will also do it. Okay, so that's installed. Now I can go off and run my library correctly. Sorry. What is the, I am not even, I think the LXML, um, yeah, I'm not even sure what that does. It's a package that Pandas apparently wants to be HTML. And it's still not happy. So I may skip on. Okay, I'm going to have to give up because I need to move on. So I apologize. I'm not sure why that did not work out. All right. So I will have to fix this there later. But basically, what we come back to is the Pandas, once it has the right package dependencies resolved, then it can go out and install, um, or grab the content out of the HTML. Yeah, I'm really, I'm pretty sad I can't do that right now. Did not get it. Yeah, it's installed. Okay. I'm going to let this crash and burn. I apologize for a lot of that working out. Maybe it will? No. Okay. Moving on. It failed. I died. All right. So you, I will get the notebook working and post a video, but you can access the HTML using pandas. Okay. You would get back a table in. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So I think this is a this is one that I think does not. Let's see, number four. Number four. Yeah, okay. So this this is like a fun example because it shows you a page that I can get to in a browser, but not in pandas. Right. So this is again. <laughs> 
more uh, names in a table. So I think, aha, I'll use pandas. That should work. And then even though I get back a, a return result, so I get back some content, when I print that content, once it gets converted, uh, yeah. OK, so I scroll down here. Not this one. All right. I may have failed also. Okay, so I think before this was not working, so fun times it does work now. Whatever. All right. I think if you went, oh yeah. Let's see. All right. I'm gonna have to give up on that one. This is not having fun. All right. One of these is broken. So we've got back a list. All right. So I'm going to ignore the user agent string in this one. So even though I've got a user agent string that says every user agent is not allowed to script this website. So that's, that's pretty pretty clear, explicit guidance. What happens if we go get that data anyways, right? So like if I Ignore the user agent string, nothing bad happens. I still get back the page content. So the, the lesson from this notebook is basically that the user agent string is just guidance. It's not enforced. So it's got to be polite, but it's not a requirement. Okay. So all this is just saying, yes, you can get the content. All right, six. Yeah. <laughs> now I think that's it for tables. So I can write. So surprisingly, four worked, but I should not have, so not sure why. So the user agent string with four somehow changed. <laughs> All right. So we can violate robots.txt. OK. So to summarize, basically, we've covered a couple of commands in the terminal. Um, we've showed request, and crappy we do not because it's too complicated. And we can now part. So this is now arm view with basically everything that you will technically need for getting data in data science. That's that's their foundation. Okay. I think we have, yeah, let's take a break. So we'll take a break and come back at about 8.55. Yes. So in my word count assignment, yeah. uh, you have written that I have like overloaded a string. Yes. So what does it mean? So, uh, so basically, I assume that I used the same string to declare him, use the same name to yeah. declare the string. And I'll show you what I mean. In the same one to in the function. That's what. Okay, so basically, so so this is basically what you did, yeah. and that works. But the problem is, so the the str is a command. So like type. 
it's a thing that exists. So it's, it's a mm. it's a variable fish. And so that's the reason why it is green. So normally, if I if I did this function. Mm, so that the, the trick here is to recognize that this is green with a reserved word. And so that's creating a collision. The consequence is, so why does it matter? So because the behavior of your thing, so a string of three produces a string. But if I do that, so let's speak down here. So if I have that type of behavior in here, so SDR of three, let's do that. So, so the difference here is that this function, even though it compiles, uh, when I call that, it's going to run into a problem because um, you're actually having this variable as hello. Yeah. So, yeah. Yep. Okay. Yep. Question. Mm -hmm. I also like. Let me write that down. I'm going to guess it's for machine learning or that it's not. No, but after looking into it a little bit, I think that's the idea. Three dimensional trees, you said? Yes. Mm, not psychic learn? Did you say psychic learn or sci fi? Okay, so it's a data structure. Uh -huh. So, so it's, I was thinking that you were saying scikit learn, which is more machine learning oriented, but sci fi like sci -fi. scientific learning. So, scientific uh, Python. So, it's more for data structure. So, Do you have any examples? No. It's used to find nearest neighbors. In the set of data, mm -hmm. like spatial data, um, but I didn't understand exactly how it was working. Oh, baby trees. Yeah, I have never heard of it and don't know anything about it. That's so. cool. I before today. How did you how did you stumble into it? Uh, I was trying to do something that took way too long. Okay. There was a better way to do it. That's Turned a good call. <laughs> um, and I got the the output is the exact same as what I was doing before. So that's I know good. That's right. Yeah. But I don't understand how it works. Okay. Um, but that's fine. I just thought. Yeah. There, Wikipedia. Awesome. All right. Let's see if there's a picture. That's what I really need. What's this all the work that right? <laughs> Space partitioning data structure. Oh, so, what kind of can I ask? What kind of data you have? Uh, yeah, I just had two sets of latitude and longitude coordinates, and I needed ah. to find the closest of one thing to another thing. Okay. Basically, I had three hundred latitude and longitude yes. coordinates, and I had two thousand. Yes. And I needed to find the closest of the second group yes. to each one, the first group. Yes, that is certainly so, a solved problem. Yeah. So, I mean, I, I really don't. Really it takes one, run it through all the others, and save the minimum, and that's a for But there's like a hand. And then I did this, and I did it instantly, and it got the exact same answer. Okay. So I was trying to understand. I'm surprised that they, why a KD tree is like. I don't understand. Okay. It but seems like there's an even more optimal solution for just like a QD tree, but whatever. Yeah. Okay. That's Glad I got it working. Okay. All right. Oh, yeah, a little bit of time.
Okay, so fun story time. I wanted to go off and find a bunch of names. And so it turns out that I know that the Social Security Administration, SSA.gov, has um, a list of baby names. Okay, so that's cool. So like every year they sort of like say what the most popular baby names are for that year. So why they do that, I have no idea how the government pays them to do that, but I don't know. Okay, so me thinking, you know, for my data science mindset, how am I going to get all those baby names for all the years, right? So that's like a pretty common question, even if you don't care about baby names. And so the first thing I go and I look at, what is the, the policy that SSA has in place? Yep. Okay, so for, for all user agent strings, that's the same for everybody. Disallow eh, everything. So basically, SSA, the Social Security Administration, is saying don't scrape our website. Right? So that sucks. Means that I probably shouldn't do that. Okay. <laughs> So let's go and see what their web pipe policy says, right? So like then it goes off and like basically says don't scare our website. So in human and technical form it says do not scare our website. That sucks. Alright. So then I go off and I ask, um, is the data just available for download? And it turns out the answer is yes. Right? So even though they don't allow scraping of their website, they have gone ahead and prepackaged all of that data and do a nice little bundle that you can just click to download. So sometimes, they just, so like, if you think about like, this organization has certainly had this request made before to it, and they don't want you crashing their servers, but they're nice and they bundle it all off for you and give you a download link. So it's worth sort of like thinking through what are all the options that we could possibly get the data. We could ask, we could send the person an email, we could do an API request, we could scrape their data, right? We could like manually get it out of everything. So like, taking all the attack vectors on your problem. Um, is useful, and so like you can search through there. I didn't find any APIs, but you can just go straight to the download. So sometimes we're nice and they bundle things up. So that's a worthwhile investigation to spend a little bit of time in before you write, you know, hundred line Python program to go off and do the same thing. Okay, so one of the things I mentioned is you should think about an API application programming interface. If you haven't heard of that or used it before. That's good, you're in 601, that's why we're here. Okay. So here's a silly website, which you should recognize where it's hosted, right? UMBC.edu, so why it's on UMBC.edu, I don't know. But basically, if you read this website, and, and you're like, what is going on here? Basically all they're saying is like, what is the distance between two words? <laughs> you know, there's a certain number of characters between these two words in a sentence. But what this thing is like, is mom, Closer to dad in some like meaning sense than bicycle? And the answer is yes. Right. So the, the the difference between the intent of the words measured numerically. Like that's, that's like a mind-boggling thing that someone would work on, but apparently it paid somebody to do it. And then they made it nice for us. Rather than like giving us all pairs of words and the distance between those words, they said, here's an API. And you're like, I don't know what an API is. But here's the good thing, Ben's gonna show you. <laughs> All right, so application programming interface. What does it mean? So let's go over to a notebook. All right. This one I have run, so I know it works. I'm going to import request. So I'm going to go off to this website. All right, swoogle.umbc.edu. So that is add it open. Not this one. All right, let's go to this website. No. Yeah, yeah, sorry. I have to actually put in the right address. All right, so that's not working, but it is happens to be the base page for this website. That's kind of weird, right? So let's read the documentation, what's going on there. This is a document that someone wrote to say, this is how to use our web page. And they even gave you this lovely snippet of code, which is where I'm getting it from. So their documentation is pretty straightforward to use. Even though you can't get to this URL, what you can get to it is basically a, a request. So I'm going to send this specially formatted thing. So if you can't see that, I'll try and read it for you. Basically, the URL that I just sent in before, I would say that didn't work. But now I'm going to say question mark operation equals API ampersand and then a word phrase one equals and ampersand phrase two equals. 
So hopefully that's pretty straightforward to understand. I'll show it to you in a little bit larger text here so you can sort of see what I was just saying verbally. So I've got this text paste it into a URL, into the, the address of a browser. And when I hit enter, it gets me back this thing, a number. Okay, so, so it's basically saying, for those two words of car and bike, what is the distance between them? Yes, the similarity of those two words, right? So like I could change this URL to be, instead of car and bike, I could put mom and dad. Okay, what's the, the similarity between those two words is 0.75, right? I mean, mom and wife, that's 45, right? Mom and car, right, 0 0.049. So somehow, like, what we can sort of, like, deduce from this is if words are similar, they're going to be closer to 1. If words are not similar, they're going to be closer to 0. So that's all the service is doing for us. It's a service, right? Okay. So that's all well and good, but now I want to use Python to do that same thing, but without typing in the word pairs that I care about. Okay, so again, it's that same base URL that you can't actually access a, as a web page. And then they basically just gave you this function, and I just copy paste the function. So all you're doing is up here in the URL, uh, you had this phrase one equals car and phrase two equals bike. Basically, those are variable names, and then the values of the variable. So this request here is using that base URL and then saying the parameters to the URL are these variables. And then because you've got that in a function, you can pass in the words. So if I type in bike and car into that function, it goes off, gets the web. Uh, I have to define the function. All right, so all I did is I took the request library, put it in a function, and then called those two variables and formatted the URL. That's all an API is. Every API that you'll ever see is a URL with some variables and values in those variables. And you can launch that request using the request library in Python. So it's pretty, pretty easy, but usually an API is not returning a single number, it's returning some complex data structure, like say all the addresses for people in Vermont. And that is more complicated, and so they'll put it into a JSON file. And so typically, when you run a curl command, you'll get back to JSON. This is just returning a string to this very simple. Are you looking? Uh, yeah, so these are extra. So those are variables that the uh, example code was requesting included with the API request. So in my original request, oops. I didn't do that. Again. Okay. So these are extra variables that um, it's suggesting be included in the request, but they're not required. There are additional parameters. Okay. So that's. Yeah. And you can basically change what uh, other. That's a word is looking at, so the corpus that can be changed. Mm, so a, a function is a thing, a set of, a, a section of code that you've defined in your program that you're calling. Um, and so, yeah, so the, the function is loaded locally in your program memory, whereas a request is going out to a remote server, getting the thing and coming back with it. So yeah, they're they're both sort of like going and getting a thing, but one's in memory and the other's on a remote server. Okay, one more fancy library after this, and then we're done with APIs. This is a fancier one. Okay, so some eyes picked over. All right. Oh yeah. So there's other. I have, in my slide deck, I have a couple other examples, but just for a quick one. So most. Uh, APIs do not allow random people to make requests to them. And so you'll have what's called an API key. And an API key is something that you register with the hosting website so that they know who's making the request. Right? So they'll, so like the way I got a key for the um, 
the Johns Hopkins University, so not, not UMBC, but Johns Hopkins, is I sent them an email and said, hey, I'd like to access your API. Can I get an API key? And then they emailed me one. And the reason I did that is to limit like how many requests and who's a social request, right? So like if, if they just said, anybody can access our, our, our API, then people would come in randomly and like make requests and overload their servers. But when I do that, I'm sending my API key, they know exactly who to contact when I go off the rails. Right? So like if I'm doing something naughty, they've already got my, my email address because I registered my API key. So registering an API key is pretty common because it allows the service owner to complain back to you when you're abusing their service. Okay. So, Sure. But they don't have your email address. They don't have your email address. They don't have a way of, so like, they can block you, but they can't send you a message saying, hey, be a nice person and, you know, be, you know, do this. They can only block you. Or rate limit you. Okay. So, uh, I have a key that I'm not going to show you because it's my private key. And then I can load that into a file. And then I'm going to send the, the request with some parameters. Right. And then I'm going to get back uh, a function. So, I can have wrapped my response in a function. So, I'm going to return that. And then it happens to be JSON, as I warned you. And then I can parse that. So, like, this is from Johns Hopkins, all of the departments that they have at Johns Hopkins. Okay, so basically I'm looking at their course catalog. Now you might see that as useful because let's say I'm running a website and I want to display all of the Johns Hopkins catalog live. Right? So I could run an API that goes and gets their current course catalog whenever someone requests it. That might be an example. Now one fun thing here is that you'll notice um, I put in a request, and then it took a little delay. I think that's because they're trying to rate limit you by putting in like a three-second delay between when they get the request and when they issue the request. But that's my guess. No, they're just putting in a delay so that like if you put in a whole bunch of requests, you wouldn't get all the data flooding back. So now you can be on the lookout like for web pages that are serving things. So like I think the my, my UMBC group events are available through an API. Okay. All right, time for an activity, and then I'm gonna skip the uh, getting data from documents. So I've talked a lot about technical things like wget and scrappy and beautiful soup. So now we're gonna talk about the other method, right? The other method is when something is not available through a computer. It doesn't mean it's not available. It just means you're going to have to use something else, like your mouth and your pretty face. So you're going to have to convince someone that you're worthy of receiving their data. This is not the same thing as a client-server interaction where you send a request and get back a response. This is where you have a conversation with someone to convince them that you're not going to harm them, you're going to do them right, and you're going to provide them value. Right? Those are that's a much more difficult conversation sometimes. So it's helpful, by the way, to communi communicate with someone in the language that they speak. Right? So if I'm going to go and talk to an engineer about some engineering data that I need from them, it may be different than going to talk to the HR people who speak more business uh, language. Right? So like I want to talk to HR differently than I'm speaking to the public relations people. Right? The arguments that I use, the language that I use, will be different because they're coming from a different circuit. And you also have to know, do they know anything about pandas or Python or Jupyter? Probably not. Do they know what a CSP is? Probably not. So those are sort of like the translation barriers, something you'll have to surmount. OK, so we have an activity. And basically, it's a role playing game. So the role playing game is some people are going to have data, and some people are going to want data. That'll so be the responsibility of the people who have the data to protect that data and make sure it doesn't get used. Okay. And for the people who want the data, you have to use all the skills that I've taught you over these many months to convince the person who has the data that you're worthy of accepting that data. And that you will use it appropriately and that you will protect it appropriately. So this is a verbal 
the sparring match that I'm setting you up for, that you know, there'll be some outcome. Either you get the data or you do not. But it's up to you to like either protect it if you're the owner or correctly see it and then that would make a whole mm -hmm. data request on your outside of you. What's the easiest Yes. <laughs> these, these, these aren't random tactics. These are tactics. Yeah, they, they are actually used. These are things that I've encountered. <laughs> it's practical. Okay, so study your role. Get in that mindset, right? If you're a data cluster, I think most of the data clusters over here, you have to think about what are the arguments that would convince the person that's protecting the data that they will give it to you. That is your goal, right? Okay. Hold your mind over here. You have to protect that data. You've had it for decades. You've built that up from scratch, right? It's worth a lot to the business. You've seen people screw things up. You have experience that people have lost data. And right? so these are the sort of arguments that you have in your head. You have experience and you want to be a good steward of the data. Okay? You write all that up. You write all yours. Okay. Find someone who is not you know, the thing that you are. That means you're going to probably have to cross the room. <laughs> Someone you haven't talked to, hopefully, like, you know, you know new.
Okay, so question for the people who are requesting the data. So data owners sit tight, data requesters, how many people got data? So we got one, two, three, four, five. Okay. How many of the data requesters did not get data? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. <laughs> really? Yeah, we ran out of time yeah. to do the thing you need to do. Bunk up to the real world. <laughs> okay. So yes, so I didn't give you enough time. That is certainly a valid complaint. Overcome by events is sort of like the way that we call it in government. So so this is a pretty standard ratio. When you go and talk to someone, you're not gonna get the data. And that's just a fact of life. They like personality wise, you might not click. You might have like worn the right clothes that day, spelled in the right way, like convinced them that the donuts were good, right? Like bribery of with food is a certainly a legitimate tactic. I didn't use it here, but showing up with donuts is a great way. Now showing up with donuts is like a super blatant way of like bribing someone, right? How to do it right. This is the Ben way, right? So you 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 wander by the person's office and you get them some donuts. You're like, hey, I just had some extra, I'm just dropping these off with the team. You know, I'll see you later. Okay. A week or two later. Hey, look, I got some, some pastries. Um, I just have too many, and here you go. And, you know, enjoy. I think I don't get why we want to request that ice cream. I mean, company wants to generate knowledge from the data. Yep. The company would choose whom they touch, and they would only give the data. Why would okay, yeah, I love your point. So his point, if I, tell me if I got this right. So the point that he's making is you have been deputized by the corporation as a data scientist, and therefore it is your duly designated responsibility to well, to take the data and analyze the data, right? It's your job. So won't that surprise you when you go to your job and you talk to some other team who's not a data scientist and they say no? That is what will happen. I I I will guarantee that. <laughs> They're in the same business, right? They're, they should be with you. They're all we're all working for the same company. We're all making money. Yeah. And they'll tell you no. I didn't get the point I was saying. My point was, suppose you are a corporation at Facebook. Yep. You are, so they post things and they do something. Suppose Google also, we make requests and things. And Google advertises, some, suppose I make a request, on, I search on something on Google, so I get advertised that thing in yes. my Instagram or something like that. Yep. Yeah. So basically, they are selling the data. They want to make businesses. Yes. So if they want to make business, they should give the data. If they couldn't give the data, they can't make a business over it. So they will give the data because they want to do the business. No. <laughs> You're thinking from an economic standpoint that the business wants to make money. Yeah. That is not the point of a business. The point of a business is to keep all the employees employed. And that may be counter giving data to you to make money. If the data is content like a banking sector, they would not give, but the data is like all the social media and that data is not that content. It is the, the goal of Facebook is to protect their data and not give it to you so that they can protect the business that they have. That, the incentives that you're going to encounter do not align with your ability to be a data scientist. So, like, but follow the history. Yeah, but, yeah back to the question. <laughs> yes. But so the point is, you. You, you, you wander by and you build up a relationship and then you start having conversations about, hey, you know, how'd your weekend go? You know, like, and they say, like, oh, I like those donuts, but, you know, I don't have any this time, but, you know, how'd your weekend go, blah, 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 right? And then, like, about a month later, after you've done that, like, about four or five times, then you say, hey, uh, I got this problem. Um, could you help me? Um, I just need a little help. Um, and I, I think that this might be useful to me. Could you give me that data? <laughs> it's asking for help after you've established a relationship and shown some value, even if the value is just donuts, right? Like clearly you want to leverage some more arguments like I'm a data scientist, I have all these qualifications, we're all working for the same company, this is how it will help you, this is how we'll defend your data. Right? All these arguments sort of like inspire to convince the person that yes, you'll provide value to them, you'll protect their reputation and their job and your credibility, and it'll all work out. Right? That's the relationship you want to convince. Tyler and then Hannah. What's a good way to smooth somebody that's not your company? He doesn't care at all. Are, are they human? Yeah. Do they eat food? No, you can't. You can't talk to them face to face because they're across the country. Okay, so they're across the country and you need to smooth with them. Yeah. What are the ways that you will encounter them? Email, phone calls. <laughs> are there ways that you can provide them value before you ask for something? Um, the value I try to provide, they can't even ask me. 
<laughs> well, talk on. So now you have a different problem, which is competing motives, right? So like you want to do something to help them, but they have no reason to leverage that. So you're gonna to have to find some unique value. But yeah, we can talk more offline. Okay. So like when you're asking for data, are you asking for like the data at that moment, or like the data at that change? In time? Like, could you maybe start by asking for the data at that moment, like a copy? Would you like that? <laughs> this is another. So like the the common phrase is like camel's nose under the tent. So like you ask for just a simple a snapshot of their data. Just like you know, a few hundred lines to understand the type of data you have. And like, could I get a, a more recent copy of that? Oh yeah. Okay. Um, can we have like a stream for that data? Oh, can you send me all the stream data? So you never ask for like all the data at first. You ask for a snapshot that's small, just to get the data structure. And you build up to a larger snapshot. Well, my computer can handle that. It's really fast. Now I can provide you value. But well, you want a recurring basis? Let's have an interaction about streaming data. And so that's the sort of like. It's incremental negotiation you have. You never start with the folding. Always a relationship. It's, so there's two games, right? There's the short game and there's the long game. There's like, can I accomplish the immediate objective that I need to get done now? That's the short game. You may get some quick wins from that, and maybe it looked like a quicker return on investment. It's almost always a bad idea because you're always going to be coming back to the same people with new problems. And so you really don't want to establish those longer relationships. So you, you might not even get the thing you want the first time, but that doesn't mean you should stop interacting with the person. It means you need to be persistent in developing a relationship so that you can ask them for a favor again in the future. Right? And yes, I have encountered people who, even though I did invest in developing a relationship and I ask them for their help, many times over the course of a year, or maybe many years, and they still always say no. And I never know, is it because it's Ben asking the question, or is it because it's the question I'm asking? Those are really hard to disentangle, and some people will just never help you. But hopefully that's a small percentage of your life. Okay. All right, so I think I'm probably going to run out of time for this, but we'll talk a little bit about it. Uh, and I think there was an activity hidden in this section, but we're not, definitely not going to get to that. Basically, the idea is that businesses do not run on CSVs or dictionaries or lists or even APIs. Like, <laughs> you'd think if you had a lot of data and it was being accessed by a lot of people through electronic means, you might post an API to make things easier, right? Both for you, the data provider, and for the people who are accessing the data. And everybody's in the right they all should be accessing the data. But it's often your data isn't structured in a, in a format that's convenient to an API. So then you end up emailing someone and asking them, hey, can you send me this Excel spreadsheet? That's the most common interaction for data exchange. Spreadsheets, PowerPoints, and Word documents. Consequence for you is you'll have to learn how to extract all that data out of those data formats. Like, I'm not excited about that. It's just a fact of life. It would be way easier if business people didn't use Excel and they actually presented the data through an API. The API is an email and Excel. Make sense? <laughs> So that means like writing those emails, it's important. All right, so let's take a look at some essay written in uh, week one. Let's see. So, data. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It did not pop up. All right, so this, this set of notebooks that I don't want, I will not get time to go through it in detail, but basically I'm going to show you that you extract data from PDFs, text files, and Word documents, and extract the strings out of those, and even the pictures. Okay. So there's a couple different libraries, because these are all very standard <laughs> problems. So you've already seen how to data extract data out of Excel using Pandas, because Pandas has a read from Excel, from Excel right? So, but there's a Python library called uh, uh, Python docx, docx being the format for for documents. Okay. okay. So, so I'm going to see if I have all those essays loaded up. Hopefully, I do. All right. All right. 
So I've got a directory. So basically, ls, if you remember from early on, that was a command that I'm listing the contents of a directory. And the directory that I have is called essays. So on my computer, I'm seeing what's in the essay directory that ends EOCX file format. So these are essays that were submitted as Word documents with a whole bunch of different titles, right? OK, that's cool. I don't want to actually have to read all those. Wouldn't it be better just to load all those into Python and see what's about? All right. So let's do it for one document. So this gets back to like this question of like, when do I need a loop? Well, it's pretty clear that I'm going to probably want to do the same thing to every element in that list. And so what I, what I do is I start out with, let's do it for one thing. And then I'm going to do it for another thing. And if those look similar, maybe I want to put it in a list to iterate over that loop. So I'm going to take the first element from that um, essays, uh, we 50 years of data science summary. So I load that in. Uh, the, the library is uh, called Python, uh, the EOCX, but it has this document library. So I'm just going to use that. Pretty cool. Right. So now, um, once I've got the data structure loaded in, I happen to know that there is a paragraphs property in that, and the paragraphs is a list of all the paragraphs in the text. And so this is where I can use a loop to iterate over that list of paragraphs. And I'm going to print out paragraph one is this, paragraph two is that. So this is that loop structure over a list. I'm just printing the content. Okay, the exciting part here is we've just extracted the text from the Word document in Python. <laughs> okay, so we've got like Excel, done. Word document, done. PDF, to do, right? PowerPoint, probably won't show you that one, but it's available. OK, so this is pretty straightforward. We've gotten text from a document. The question is, would you really want to do that for all the Word documents? That's pretty straightforward. Okay, I think I'm going to come back to that later. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Where you're asking about paragraph? Uh, let's see. So I have document. Let's look at that. So the type of document is, again, it's specialized to this Python library. And so the methods by which I, it's just like beautiful soup, where you have like soup.title, soup.title.txt. So it's a, right. So, so there's sort of two ways to go about it. One is to just sort of randomly splunk around, like explore the library using like type and like exploring the variables here. The other is to, uh, or I had that. So typically, it's a little easier to get started with the documentation because they'll have examples. And the way that I work is I'll just like copy paste this text from the example in the documentation and see if it works in my code. And if it does, I'm done. Like I don't even. I don't typically bother reading all the text. I like my search mental model is find the snippet of code. Is that what I need? Based on the memory template. Okay. I'm just super lazy. Yes. I I see. Okay. I don't have. I don't have. I don't think I have. So I'll put it on my backlog of things to do. I'm going to put a word. I'm going to create a word document with a table and then parse it using Python docx. I don't know the answer, but I probably won't be able to. Right. The it's looking. For, it's assuming things are in paragraphs, but I don't know what happens if it doesn't see a paragraph. Good question. So I think we're going to skip over the activity in order to get to the, I'm trying to figure out how much time I have left for the. So would you rather see more notebook demos, or would you rather do an activity? Let's take a book. So if you want to do an activity where you're working in with a partner, raise your hand. OK, we've got one, two, three, four, five, six. Six partner program people. Absolutely. Does this, does this argument convince you if you want to do pair program? Huh? Okay, the activity 
is if you go over to Blackboard and week three. Okay, so I, yes, to, to, to inform your voting, let's do that. So open up Blackboard, go to course materials, good point, week three, getting data. At the top, there is a week one essay text for analysis. So you would be downloading that text file and then you would um, load that data into a data structure in Python. And you wouldn't be doing this solo. You'd be doing this with a randomly paired partner who you haven't met yet. OK, so now that you know what the activity is, who wants to do the activity? <laughs> One, two, three. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Not quite half. All right, so the other people who do not want to see it, you're going to get demos. Who wants to see a demo? So I know how this works. So there's two, two choices, and then most people don't vote. So who wants to see? No, I'm not sure PDF. OK, so who wants to see PDF demo sheets? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. 10, okay. 11. have a pretty clear majority. OK, so we're going to do more demos. We're going to cruise through them. So the quick. Uh, solution here is basically it's pretty easy to read a file from a text document, like a word, uh, text, plain text document, and then you just want to loop over the list of elements there. Okay. So we're going to go back to the demos. Oops, I didn't get to back to the rest of them. Okay. So we just, to, to come back to where we were, we had a list of documents, and we saw how to load one document using the Python docx. Okay. All right. So basically, this is that function that we had in the previous notebook where we were just looping over all the paragraphs and storing those paragraphs. And previously, we were printing them, but here we're going to write them into the dictionary. So just for your visualization, let's compare this to the previous function. Right. So previously, we had, uh, we had a document, and we had a list of paragraphs in it. And then for each paragraph, we we're just printing it. So, so far, so good. So now, typically, you don't want to print things when you're analyzing a lot of data. And so what we'll do is we'll store the results to a dictionary. Okay, so dictionary design, I have a list of things. I want to store it into a, a dictionary where I have the which paragraph I am, so it's like paragraph one, paragraph two, paragraph three. Those are the keys, and then the value is the text. So that's what my dictionary looks like. So we just have a key and a value, and the value is a string. Uh, like Ben, that doesn't help us because it only gets us one dictionary for one document. Okay. So let's do that. Oh, I do have a print pair. So. so that is my key value pair. It looks like a big wall of text because it's all the things that are in the text document, so it's not too exciting. But it sort of tells us that there is now a thing, a, a dictionary, that we're storing the document in. So we've just transformed from a Word document on our computer to a dictionary in Python's memory. That's like a big first step. Okay, so now I have to figure out, okay, remember I had those files, and I have to figure out how am I going to get the same operation applied to all these things. Well, first I'm going to have to take that list of files and convert it into a list. And so if you want to do that, there's this library called OS operating system. So it's going to go off and talk to your operating system and say, Rather than navigating through File Explorer or Finder in Mac, it's going to ask the OS directly, can you tell me all the things that are in the directory essays? And it returns a list. That is exactly what we needed. That is a I don't know, miracle for me. I, mean, like, I can't imagine having to do that manually. That would be a lot of work. I wouldn't even know where to start on that one. All right, so now we've got a really complicated uh, uh, structure here of, of code, and so we're going to walk through this line by line. So, I'm going to say the directory that I'm in is essays. And that's the that's variable because maybe my directory later will change. And I'm going to say OS list viewer directory. So it's going to 
populate a list structure with all of the files that are in that directory. And then the for loop is going to iterate over those. Right? So it's going back to the same point that we had in a class of, am I doing the same thing over and over? Yes, use a list. Okay. Now we have a variable where it's the, the file name from the directory. And then I have to do a little bit of exception handling because my directory has more than just Word documents. So I have to be able to figure out, is it a DOCX or a doc? Then I want to proceed. But if it's a PDF or .txt or .log, don't do anything. And so skip over that. There's like a, an implicit else here, but do nothing. And then the last thing is I'm going to take um, the directory and the file name and put those together. Now, why would I do that? This isn't this isn't anything about loading the, the, the text from the document. This is now about just like verifying that this loop structure is right. But I didn't do anything here. I just printed inside there. You know, like Ben, all you've done is reconstructed the thing that you showed us in the previous command. Stop wasting our time. I'm like, okay, okay. But the point is, I just verified that the, this whole administrative overhead here of code, the for loop and the if statement, does what I need it to do. Now, now that I've got that working and I know this, I can combine it with this other function that I wrote previously. Right, so that's good news. I can take a thing that works for one thing, put it inside of a, a loop that I know works, and by not doing everything at once, I have more hope that the thing that it will work combined with another thing that will work is more likely to work. So, don't do everything at once. Um, verify that your loops work separately from the thing that you're putting inside the loop. So now, if you remember, I've got the loop that I just showed works, and then I'm going to say call this function against what? Against the thing that I am uh, currently that I was printed, printing, right? But now I have to instead of printed, I have to load the document in your variable and then grab the text out of there. So I'm using the function that I previously wrote and the loop that I previously wrote. But I'm doing it for every element in that list. Who is confused yet? Yes. So I'm going to basically to summarize quickly what I went over, and then I'm going to divert over to the homework assignment. So I, I first, in the previous notebook, actually, I demonstrated that I can get the text out of a document. And then I put that inside of a function, and the function is now storing the the content of that Word document into a variable. Okay. And then I demonstrated that I have a set of files in a directory, and then I wrote a demonstration showing that this thing right here is what I care about in terms of looping over all the elements of that list. And then, so I now that I took these, I basically passed that um, into the uh, the, the document command, which is that library that was. And the thing that I get back from here is the text of the document put in a special variable. And then, then I can pass this to the, the function that I had previously, and I'll separate out into a dictionary. And this is where we're not get confused. Right? So the, this function is returning a dictionary that looks something like this, right? With like one paragraph one, two, two paragraph two. Right? The confusing thing is, I'm storing the output of this variable, whatever it is, into a new dictionary. That's where your mind will probably move, right? So now we have nested dictionaries. We have, at the top level, a dictionary of all the file names as keys. And then the value associated with that top level dictionary is the dictionary of all the characters. That's right. So we have a nested dictionary. So the first top level is keys is equal to the, word, the, the file name. And then the nested is the index of the paragraphs. Okay, so let's take a look. Yes, that's true. Oh, I'm going to hit my time boundary. Apologies. Okay, so basically the point is it worked and they're done. But there's many more notebooks. We're going to skip over that. All right, this will all show up in a, in a video. Big data, we're going to skip. Okay, homework. Homework's pretty. Uh, Quick to tell you about, but then you're gonna have questions hopefully. So if you want, you can stick around or you can leave. I don't feel bad if you leave right now. But what I want to get across is I'm gonna send you, I'm gonna post in, in Blackboard a zip file. And you'll have to extract the zip. You don't have to do it in Python, but you can take the, the file content in that zip and it's gonna be an XML file. 
And they're like, Ben, that's great news. You already taught us about XML files were done, right? And I'll say, no, you're not, because within the HTML tag is, sorry, within that XML tag is HTML. And this is where you'll get stuck. The stuck part is that the HTML doesn't actually look like HTML. And the reason for that is because if it did, it would be confusing with the XML. So XML and HTML have pretty similar tagging formats. And so when HTML is embedded in XML, the format is changed. So the challenge is for you to back the HTML out of the XML, and then tell me about the number of links in the, XM, in the HTML. OK, so, so that's pretty complicated. And it's not the total number of links. It is the number of links per HTML file. So the easy sort of like escape clause out of this is like most the people who get this homework wrong do the following. They say, OK, I, you, I got the, H, the XML file. I'll just count the number of links in the XML file. I'm done. And then you will be wrong. And the reason you'll be wrong is because you didn't know which one of those links were associated with, with which HTML document. So you have to first separate out the HTML from the XML. There's multiple HTML documents in that XML. And then for each of those HTML files, how many links are there? Okay. So then you're like, Ben, why do you come up with these crazy, crazy problems? That's not very realistic. Is it? Yes, Jessica. So, oh, so one more thing before I give up. <laughs> so, so basically, this 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 idea of embedding HTML in XML is how WordPress exports all of their files. So, if you've ever used WordPress for blogging, you're familiar with this data format. And there's even an example you can look on the website. It's a little different, but I gave you something that's not quite the same. Okay. So, my suggestion to you is to um, figure out, like, start at the end. And what I mean by that is like. What is the output that you think should be produced in order to satisfy this requirement? So that's where like, I think Jessica was jumping to uh, number three, which is basically telling you, what do you think the design of the data structure of the output shall be? And if you can figure that out, then you'll have a sort of like thing to work towards. Right? So you know you're starting from XML, and the endpoint is whatever data structure you think is going to satisfy this, how are you going to get from the starting to endpoints? And I think I explicitly mentioned. Okay, so I, I intentionally call out beautiful soup for like I'm forcing you to use a library. I'm not making you guess. I'm forcing you. So it's explicit, it's intentional. I'm not. So I'm not. I'm not telling you what library to parse XML in. Like you definitely should not write an XML parser. You should use somebody else's library. There's lots of choices. I showed you a couple of them in week one. Okay, so people have not left yet. Is that because you're stuck, confused, or just glued to your seat? Kristen. Uh, you want to see me do this last part? It's on the. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah. Yes, yes. Good question. The last slide here is a request. Uh, there's advice, which you can read. And there's a measurement request. So the measurement request is I want to know where you're at at the. Yeah, so either you finished with it. Or uh, tell me where you are at after an hour. Absolutely. There's no time bound on this one. I just want to know, like, are you dead in the water? Have you already finished it? Where are you at? Okay. Yep. I'll leave some tips up on the top. I'll take your name tags back and the roles. The role thing, I'll take back. Yeah. 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 Yeah.